Good morning. John doesn't have any announcements, so I was confused. So, um, it's a well. It's a nice, bright, sunshiny day, and just enough snow that when you're driving, it reflects up and blinds you, so you can't see. So it's a great day. But uh, anyway, and I'm glad you guys have have made it. And as a little bit of a warning. From now until Easter, you're going to hear Christmas music because this is the beginning of my season for celebration because Christmas Day is because of Easter, if it wasn't for that. So, st start out with, I'll be reading from Psalms 95, verses 1 through 7. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hand, and the, in his hand are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are also his. The sea is his, for he made it, and the dry land which his hands have formed. Come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep of his hand. Will you join me in prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, as we come together the day after your son's birth, let us celebrate, let us worship, let us listen to your words and our pastor's message and open our hearts and minds to understanding. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Okay, for the scripture reading, I'm reading Philippians 2, 1 through 11. If there is any that encourage in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being of full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard it equally with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of salvation, being born in human likeness and being formed in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Therefore God also highly exalt him and give him him the name that is above every name, so that the name of Jesus every knee should bend in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. I sing praises to the Lord uh, that should be on the overhead and then uh, but we can all stand and sing together. I sing praises to the Lord. Oh Lord, praises to your name. Oh Lord, oh your name is great. And greatly to be I sing praises to your name, O Lord. Praises to your name, O Lord. For your name is great and greatly to be praised. Then I give glory. I give glory to your name. Glory to your name, 
19 in the red hymnal. Corinthians chapter 8 verses 10 through 15 and in this matter I am giving my advice it is appropriate for you who began last year not only to do something but to even desire to do something now finish doing it so that your eagerness may be matched by completing, completing it according to your means for Thursday for if the eagerness is there, the gift is acceptable to what one has, not according to what one does not have. I do not mean that there should be relief for others and pressure on you, but it is a question of fair balance between your present abundance and their need, so that their abundance may be for your need in order that there may be fair balance, as it is written, the one who had much did not have too much, and the one who had little did not have too little. Stand and join me in singing the doxology.
may be seated. Good story? Let's do that. Nancy, would you like to come up? I have another rock. I got lots of rocks. Actually, I got, Gail, I think this one came from you. So thank you. What do you think of that rock? It's not much, is it? What do you think's under? Oh, oh, you turned it over. What do you think that? Oh, you know what this is? This is obsidian. It is volcanic glass. That's kind of interesting to think about, isn't it? What do you guys do with glass usually? You look through it in windows and things. And one of the nice things about glass is that it lets light go through. You see this window behind us here with all the different colors on it? That's all glass that lets the light shine through. And we've got a nice picture there of Jesus. And it, it, it tells a story. And clear glass, you can look through that and you can see things on the other side. This isn't clear glass, is it? No, it's kind of dark and black. But I'll tell you something. Did you know that for pretty much all of human history, glass wasn't used to look through? You know what the people valued about glass? They valued it because it was sharp. You guys ever, ever broken a glass or seen a broken glass and they're saying, be careful, don't cut yourself. Glass is very sharp when it breaks. I break. I have yeah, I have too. So for a really long time, people valued glass because they could cut things with it. If they needed to cut plants or if they had to cut leather or different things, they could use glass to cut things. And so for all this time, glass was important because it was sharp. Now, glass is important because we can see through it. And it can let us let light come through. Two different things that you can use glass for, right? You know what? Each of us has a special purpose too. We also have something, and we may not know what it is. We may think that it's important for us to do this one thing, but God says, you know what? I have something different for you, something special for you that maybe you didn't think about. It's kind of nice to know that we have a special purpose and that God has that for us, isn't it? Whether it be because we can be sharp or whether we can shine, have light shine through us, either one is important. And everything that God has for you is important too. That's kind of nice to know, isn't it? That God has a plan for us. And not just for us, but you know who else God has a plan for? All these people behind me. Yes, they have something that God wants them to do too. And it's special. All right, let's pray together, okay? Dear Lord, we thank you that you have a special plan for us. And we may not know what it is. We may think it's one thing. But you know perfectly what we are best at and what you want us to do. Help us to be surrendered to you and to follow you and to know what it is that you would have us do so that we can do it well. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, thanks. You guys can go. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Number 241 in your red hymnal. Let's stand and sing it together. First and the fourth. It is so sweet to trust in Jesus. Just him at his word. Just to rest upon just to know the saith the Lord Jesus Jesus how I trust him how I move him more and o'er Jesus Jesus bread oh for grace to trust him more number four 
I'm so glad I learned to trust Thee. Jesus, save your friend, and I know with me will be with me to the end. Jesus, Jesus, how I trust him, him more and more. Jesus, Jesus, precious Jesus, oh, for grace to trust him more. And then, uh, ah, just a closer walk with thee. And we're going to do uh, one and, uh, yeah, one, two, and three. Okay, good. I am weak, but thou art strong. Jesus, keep me from all wrong. I'll be satisfied as long I walk, let me walk close to Thee Just closer walk with Thee, with Thee Granted Jesus is my plea Daily walking close to Thee. Be, dear Lord, let it be. And to, through this world of toils and snares, if I falter, Lord, who cares? Just a closer walk with Thee, with Thee. Branded Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. And number three. When my feeble life is o'er, for me will be no more. <clears throat> Guide me safely o'er thy kingdom shore to thy shore. Just a closer walk with Thee. Granted, Jesus is my plea. Daily walking close to Thee. Let it be, dear Lord, let it be. That's a great bass voice or uh, tune there. Please be seated. It's a great bass song if you can get down that low. Um, want to invite you to turn in your Bibles to Matthew chapter 20 for our scripture reading today. Beginning in the 20th verse, Matthew tells this really interesting story. If you're a parent and you want the best for your kids, you might, uh, this story might not set quite as well as you'd like it to, but stay with it till the end and you'll, you'll get where we're going. Verse 20, then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons 
And kneeling before him, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? And she said to him, declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one on your right hand and one on your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, you do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, we are able. And he said to them, you will indeed drink my cup. But to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those whom it has been prepared by my father. Now when the ten heard about it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. It will not be so among you, but whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave, just as the Son of Man came, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. We have a colony of red ants, ant hill, just off the side of our driveway. And in the summertime, they do their thing. They're out wandering around, coming and going, gathering and storing. They rebuild the hill every time that it gets damaged. We do that. Sometimes we accidentally run over it, and they get back to work on it. Now, most colonies, ant colonies, they have a, a structure, sort of a hierarchy, if you will, uh, with different ants performing different duties. There's the single queen there in the, in the colony, and then there are the males. Their job is to mate with the queen, and then there are soldiers, and then there are workers. It's pretty standard. Pretty much every ant colony has a structure that's like this, and since I suspect that an ant's cognitive capacity is relatively limited, I don't think they're deciding what they want to do. I don't think they go to the guidance counselor and they take a test and they said, you're going to be fit to do this and you're going to be fit to do that. I, probably not how it is. I think that they're programmed uh, to be who they're meant to be, what, what they'll be and what their role is that they'll fill. I could be wrong. Well, no one get into an ant's head, but I doubt that ants think about changing their social status. Boy, I wish I could move on up to a different part of the colony. There's no ladder of success for ants to climb. It seems like there's quite a few creatures that do this, not just ants, the lower order invertebrates. Any social animal, from ants on up, they, they arrange themselves naturally into some kind of a social order, a hierarchy. Fascinated by this. Uh, the social structure of wolves, for instance, is really interesting. The wolf pack, it's, it's a profoundly stratified structure. There's the alpha male and the alpha female. They're the ones that have the cubs. And then the rest of the pack fills in with appropriate duties. Uh, some of them help hunt and some of them stay behind and watch over the litter while the pack is out. But they're all together invested in the success of this alpha pair's offspring. That's it. That's what you do. That social hierarchy within the pack, it serves a purpose passing on the strongest, most viable genetics in the form of the alpha pair's cubs. You've heard of a lone wolf? Well, a lone wolf is an anomaly. It's weird, it's strange, it's an outlier, and it's really a genetic dead end. Because if that lone wolf doesn't join a pack, then its end is its end. Now, Apparently, there are some pretty good reasons for all this to happen, for these animals to form these hierarchies. They get more done that way. Social stratification in the animal world, it can promote success. Uh, ants are a lot stronger together than they are individually. And the success of the colony is more important than the success of a single individual within it. Now, there are some people that study this kind of thing, behaviorists, they theorize that since it's such a beneficial thing in the animal kingdom that uh, it seems like a lot of creatures are just hardwired for it. They don't even think about it. They just form these, these hierarchies. They also think that when humans do it, that it's only natural and beneficial as well. But I wonder about that. 
We may, as creatures that are part of God's great creation, we may have tendencies that we share with other creatures. But God has given us something special, the capacity to choose to be different. Unlike ants, who don't really get a lot of choice in their station, we can choose to move around on this social hierarchy. And because we can choose to climb the ladder, we can also choose something else. So the question for us is, what's the best choice that we can make? Today is the day after Christmas. How many of you know what day today is? It's Boxing Day. Yes. Some countries celebrate this Boxing Day. And like a lot of holidays, Boxing Day has a lot of different stories about where it came from. Uh, how you're supposed to celebrate it. One story, it comes from uh, the, the old British manor house world, you know, the, the Downton Abbey kind of world. If you've watched these on PBS or some other channel, the, the period pieces, uh, the show, it's set on some country estate somewhere in the 1800s. You know what I'm talking about, the big house, and you're familiar with the structure of the household. There's the lord of the manor, the lady of the house. They're the alpha pair. Then there's the family and the, the different levels of authority and influence there. These are the upstairs people. And then you've got the downstairs people, the butlers and the stewards, the cooks, the, the serving maids. So back to Boxing Day. What are you supposed to do uh, when the upstairs people want to celebrate Christmas? Well, if you're a downstairs kind of person, the downstairs people made sure that everybody upstairs had a great celebration. That was their job. You made sure that everything was the way it needed to be, that you attended to their every need. Uh, but that meant that the downstairs people didn't get to celebrate Christmas on Christmas. They were working. And so on the day after Christmas, it came, became a tradition for the upstairs people to, to gather up gifts and food and things into a box and then take it to the downstairs people so that they could celebrate. They could have their own day. Now think about this. Whether you celebrate Christmas on Christmas or on Boxing Day says an awful lot about where you slot into the hierarchy, where you are on the ladder. And so in a sense... Boxing Day is just a reminder of the way that we as human creatures create these social hierarchies and the way that we reinforce them. For us, life can be a lot like a wolf pack. Now, since it is Boxing Day, the day after Christmas, I suspect a lot of you are still in that post-Christmas glow. I think all those folks who aren't here today are in that post-Christmas glow, maybe a little deeper than we are at least I, I hope that you are. Not the leftover haze of the uh, commercialized consumption that passes for Christmas for much of our society, but that real lingering wonder that the realization of God's love and grace should give us. Think about this for a moment. We've already read the stories and we've reread the stories we've heard it once and again we've reflected on all those characters the shepherds the the magi the the songs of the angels along with the gospel writers we stood at the stable in front of the manger we sat out in the nighttime fields under a starry sky we we journeyed far from the east we've witnessed along with countless generations of believers that wonder that is Emmanuel God with us we've rejoiced in the mystery of the incarnation that God would do this put on flesh live among us just as it begins the Gospels, the story of Jesus' birth is just the beginning. But what a wondrous beginning it is. And I hope that you can hold on to it. Hold on for a long time to that genuine wonder. There's a reason that we celebrate Christmas as a church. Because in order for the blood of Jesus to do what it needs to do, it, Jesus had to come. Jesus was willing to share the things that we experience, our pain, our suffering, our joy, everything that we have. Jesus chose to take on our form. As Paul says in Philippians, 
So Christmas is the beginning of this wonderful gospel story, but it's certainly not the end. There are more steps for us to take along this journey. So hang on to that wonder. And hanging on to the wonder of the incarnation, to Emmanuel, God with us, it's important because we might be tempted to just go back to the ordinary. We might be tempted to celebrate Christmas and then return to that base, creaturely self-interest that, that shapes so much of the world around us. I think there are some that miss the truth completely. They don't even get out of that. <laughs> Christmas is a chance for them to revel in that base, uh, creaturely self-interest. See, we're humans. And as human creatures, it's hard for us to escape this tendency that we have to kind of angle for our own benefit, to get what we need to get, to climb a little higher on that ladder or up the stairs, if you want to think of it that way. Now, these folks that study it, the secular behaviorists, they, they might just throw up their hands and say, well, that's how we are, so why fight it? We certainly see it played out in the Gospels as they move from Jesus' birth on into his ministry and his interactions with the disciples. This story from Matthew's Gospel is just one of many examples, but it's a good one. Jesus is having a hard time communicating this to his disciples, trying to get them to understand that there's a different pattern that you can follow you don't have to follow the pattern of the world. You don't have to strive for position and prestige. Jesus is offering them another way. So let's take a look at the story. In verse 20, we see it's not the disciples that do this, uh, James and John. They're not the ones that come to Jesus, but their mother doing what moms do, protecting their kids. I don't know if her boys put her up to it, but you know, if this is just an example of of mom wanting something more for her children, but either way, you could see the world's way of thinking just writ large over everything she does. We're not going to beat up on James and John's mother, though. Okay, She's doing what we do. And to be honest, she doesn't have any kind of frame of reference. This is really the only way that they know how to move through life. Try to be a little better than you were. Try to move up a little more than where you were. There's no alternative at this point. The ladder, it's there. And the purpose is to climb as expeditiously up that ladder as you can. And don't miss this point either. The mother of James and John went a lot further than most who had encountered Jesus. She had a very strong conviction, a, a sure and certain belief that Jesus was the one that she needed to go to that Jesus was going to reign. So she had this understanding that Jesus was a true Messiah, which we should give her credit for. But she's still caught up in this worldly understanding, this creaturely way of thinking that feels like it's necessary for us to classify and to rank and to put some people over others. So what Jesus confronts her with, and, and what he confronts her sons with, really, they're there too, is this. The path to the kingdom of God, you want to you sit on my right and left, you want to reign in this glory, but the path, it's not what you think it is. See, it's going to go through some rough terrain. It's not a smooth road to the throne here. The path grows through the cross and the grave. It's a path of sacrifice. It's not a path of privilege. It's a path of service. It's not a path of being served. So this is a fundamentally different way to, to think about life than the one that the world puts forward as the norm. And that's really what's at the heart of the issue. Later in the passage here, we, we see, after all the rest of the disciples have gotten all cranky about what happened, they're, they're upset. I don't know really what they're upset about. Maybe they're upset that James and John thought of it first. I don't know. I'm going to get there before us. But at any rate, they're upset. Later on, James and John, they seem to have jumped the line here. But Jesus says, you know what, I'm going to set you right. I'm going to lay out two options for you, two alternatives. In the world's thinking, in the way that the world processes, in the way the world acts, the people on char in charge, the rulers, what do they do? They lord it over you. 
It's a great way of, 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 of talking about this. They dominate you. That's the way they do things. They, they, they're, they're tyrants, if you will. And really, they do it for their own benefit. That's, that's the way it works. The, 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 the lording over, the tyranny is for the good of those with status. Just like that alpha pair in the wolf pack, the elite of the world get the most benefits. It's the way it works. Boxing Day is just one more reminder, one more way for us to reinforce those creaturely patterns of self-interest. Resources flow that direction, flow towards those with more resources. That's the way of the world. But Jesus flips it all upside down. He turns it on its head. Instead of angling for advantage, Jesus calls his followers to do something different. The opposite. He says, don't grab position. Give it up. Give up the status. Take on the role of a servant. Instead of shouldering your way and elbowing up to get upstairs, we're called to choose to be downstairs. It's a pretty radical thing. I suspect that some of us might go, Err. I know I do. <laughs> that doesn't fit quite right. That doesn't make sense. It's tough for us to warm up to this idea of putting others' needs before our own. You see, isn't being a servant what you see in the Downton Abbey? In the upstairs, downstairs world? Isn't being a servant just another word for being a doormat and getting walked all over? Well, that is our thinking. And yes, in the accounting of the world, that is the way that it works. The servant doesn't have anything. The servant has no privilege, has no power, has no autonomy, has no control. The Bible uses the word servant. It's translated as servant. It's often literally slave. The servant is taken advantage of. They don't get Christmas on Christmas Day. They have to wait till the next day, Boxing Day. And all of that's true in the world's accounting. But what if we remembered who holds the world? This one that holds the world is not some petty tyrant who's asking us to be servants just so that he can live a little more comfortably. You see, we're talking about Jesus here, the one whose birth we just celebrated, the one that the Father sent to redeem us all, and the one who chose himself to be a servant. And so maybe there is more to this servanthood thing than just what the world says and just what the world takes into account. Maybe the last really can be first. See, I think this is what Jesus is getting at. Verse 28 of this passage, Jesus says that he, the Son of Man, did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. That's the plan. That's what God wants to happen. Jesus is going to have to drink a bitter cup. He's going to have to go to the cross and he was going there to die for our sake. So the plan always included that. Included that sacrifice. And this principle that redemption comes when Jesus puts us in front of himself. Paul, a little bit later on in his letters, he talks about the idea that Christ crucified makes no sense. He says it's a, it's a stumbling block to the Jews. It's foolishness to the Gentiles. That stuck with me. What Jesus does doesn't make sense. It's foolishness to the Gentiles. It, it, it trips us up. It doesn't make sense. Nobody understood it. We don't understand it. We accept it, and we're grateful for it, I know that I do. This is, this is a wonderful thing, but it just it doesn't quite fit right in my head. How can giving up one's life ever produce anything? Isn't keeping one's life the way to success? Isn't putting my own desires first the only way that I'm going to have those desires realized? Now we can see that Jesus was willing to lay down his life for our sake, willing to be the servant instead of the one being served. And somehow we can accept that. 
We can accept that salvation is connected in some way to his faithful sacrifice. But as far as personally doing that, personally taking on the life that Jesus modeled, sort of what Paul talks about again in that Philippians passage, being servants of each other, uh, ourselves, well, yeah, that's tough. That doesn't make as much sense. You see, we'd rather be on Jesus' right hand or his left hand in his kingdom. That's what true success looks like, doesn't it? We think. Now, to be clear, that miraculous redemptive power of Jesus, what Jesus does through his sacrifice, thank heavens, is not dependent upon us. If we are servants in the manner Christ calls us to, or if we're more like James and John, wanting positions of power and status, either way, the blood of Jesus still heals. The blood of Jesus still restores, whether we're part of it or not. And so, well, why does it matter then that we copy Jesus? That we try to do what he did? It matters because Jesus called us to it. Jesus asked us to do it. Jesus commanded us to do it. And if we obey, then it matters because we're showing that Jesus matters. That Jesus is important to us. To accept redemption but not follow through on faith with faithfulness, that undermines our witness. People look at that and they go, do you really believe that? Do you really believe that he saved you? Because you're not really paying him much attention when he told you to do things. People are really less likely to consider Jesus if we don't consider him ourselves, if we treat his teaching with apathy. Now, I get that it seems risky. I'm not sure I could commit to this. All that the world has told us is that when we're not clawing our way up the ladder, that we're being stepped on by somebody else who's going over our backs to get higher. Servants, they're taken advantage of. They're abused. They're treated poorly. They're kept downstairs on Christmas Day. They can't celebrate. That's the world's message. Don't do that. So we're naturally resistant of that idea. And there may even be something hardwired into us as creatures that resist that. But what if the way things worked in the world was not the only way that things could work. What if there really was an alternative, an option number two? You see, this is what I think is going on. What do we all want out of life? We want wholeness. We want completeness. We want peace. This is what's all encapsulated in that biblical principle of shalom. A peaceful life that has no lack, that is whole and complete. But how do we get there? How do we achieve that wholeness? That's the issue. Now the world tells you to do something specific to get there. You will will achieve this wholeness. It's almost as if we're hardwired to go that way. The world says, in order to achieve, climb that ladder. Aspire reach, strive for greatness. Even if there's somebody in the way, we'll just crawl right over their backs to get there. And if the world was all that there was, if that was it, then we probably would do that. We would not be able to escape our creaturely nature. We'll be ants. We'll be wolves. Being who we are programmed to be, who need to arrange ourselves in hierarchies just for survival. But Jesus says, you're not that. You're not that. Jesus offers us another way to wholeness. I'll tell you right now, I believe that Jesus offers us the only way to wholeness, to true peace, shalom, because creation is always subordinate to the creator. And if the creator says, yes, there is another way, another way that I want you to live, a better way, then I think we ought to pay attention. So to put the needs of others before your own. To be a servant instead of one who seeks to be served. This is not human nature. This is a mark of the divine nature. This is what God is like. You see, we're too selfish to be, for this to be part of our natural makeup. But with God in us, with the Spirit 
in us, we do have the potential to live as Jesus lived. We can see that service and sacrifice, it's not a road to be taken advantage of. It's not a road to becoming a doormat of being walked on and abused. But it is actually the only way that we will find true fulfillment and true wholeness. And yes, we don't have it in us. Our capacity to do this, to follow the example of Jesus, it's limited. But it does begin with something we do, and that is make a choice. You see, we have to decide that, yeah, that, that's a viable way to live. That is an alternative. That is a choice. That is an option that I have. We have to decide it. And when we do that, that means that we trust Jesus. That we believe that Jesus is telling us the truth when he says, as he does in Matthew 6, 32 and 33, that everything that we need will be provided for us when we seek God's kingdom first. That essentially, it means that do what God wants you to do and everything else is going to get sorted out. God will take care of us. And we don't have to do it ourselves. Constantly looking out for ourselves. So accepting that servant's role, it is a step of faith. It is hard. I admit that. But it is a step that we need to take. It's the next step that comes after the celebration of Christ's coming. Because when we take that next step, it shows what we really believe about Christ. It shows that we believe that he has come and that we believe that Christ will make all things new. Pray with me. Gracious God, we know how we are made. On one level, we are creatures with those base human instincts for self-preservation and self-advancement. Lord, we want what we want. And oh, we want it bad sometimes. We want it so bad that we're willing to hurt others in, the, in how we acquire it, how we grab it. We seek position and status because we feel like those things will give us what we want. Security, peace. Lord, when we get on that treadmill, it just doesn't stop. There's always a rung on the ladder that's a little higher. And it's an empty life, Lord, and we know that. For those times, Lord, when we have sought our own interest, when we have put our own desires in the front of the needs of others, if we have been selfish in any way, we ask your forgiveness. We know that you sent your son to redeem us, but it wasn't just so that we could be redeemed. It was so that we could live a life that is brings you glory and honor and in doing so we need to be like Christ so we ask for the strength of your spirit to do it we pray that you would inspire us breathe life into us give us strength that we need in order to serve others and in serving others serve you and help us to be content with all that you have for us we pray these things in the name of Christ Amen. Your eyes upon Jesus, all 17 verses. No, there's only one. <laughs> with that again after our prayer 
If you'd bow with me, Lord, we come to you again. We pray that you would bless these, your people. Guide them in the paths that you would have them. Show them the work that you have for them. Give them opportunities to love, to shine light into the world, to be who you want them to be. Keep them all safe. Protect them. For those that can't be with us today, we pray that you would be present for them in a special way. Keep them safe where they are as well. And gather us together, together again so that we may praise and worship you. We pray in the name of the one who we turn our eyes to, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's sing that again. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful grace. And the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. You may go in peace.